Now, Tom, you've been focused on the downside momentum in inflation for a while. Um, it, it's gotten a little sticky in terms of the official readings recently. Um, Scott talking about the risk that it perks up again. How do you think that plays out from here? Uh, I think the Fed's comfortable that inflation isn't going to necessarily have a, a large wave that takes us back to emergency levels sure. of hiking. Um, but, you know, these reports are, you know, I can kind of quibble with them because, you know, this, this most recent PC report, almost a quarter of the inflation was magazines for the month. And so, you know, is that repeatable or because it was in, in the last 70 years, the highest monthly increase in magazine prices. Right. I mean, you can usually pick an outlier yeah. on a one month basis, but sure. That's yeah. right. So I, I mean, I think the other piece of it that I think is maybe uh, more long lasting has been the fact that um, portfolio management fees, right? So yeah. basically the stock market goes up, you kind of impute that there's this rise in, ma in portfolio management fees, which really nobody pays out of pocket. It's, it's, it's one of these funny things where it's uh, it's sort of like, how much do you want to fixate on that? Yeah, and the fees come out of your, your gains. Not, exactly. It's not coming out of somebody's yeah. wallet. So you, that's a great point. And I think ultimately consumer expectations of inflation have been really stable, and I think mm -hmm. that's what matters more to the Fed. And I, I think if the Fed even just cuts one time next year, it's still a dovish Fed and it's, it's actually bullish because it The power of the Fed Lee emphasizes that the Federal Reserve is the most powerful entity in the world due to its control over monetary policy, which can significantly influence the economy. The Fed has the ability to set interest rates, manage inflation, and stabilize financial markets, making it central to the functioning of both the U.S gives us a lot more fuel. Yeah, I mean, historically, you don't want the Fed in, uh, you know, in emergency mode. And, uh, and I keep pointing out, in 95 into 96, I think you only got a couple, three cuts. Uh, and they went on hold for a while, worked out okay. Stephanie, I wonder about your perch there and your window on what, uh, what individual investors are doing and how they're prioritizing uh, the movement of their money. And I, I say that as a moment when it does seem as if there's been this rekindling of energy within certain parts of the market. Some of these uh, kind of retail trader favorites are flying again. And this idea that obviously if we are in um, a you know kind of higher animal spirits type environment, environment that that might run for a while. Cash on the sidelines, he mentions that there's a lot of cash on the sidelines, meaning that investors are holding cash instead of putting it into the market. This cash could potentially flow into small cap stocks, which may see growth if this money starts to be invested. Gotcha. I know you've obviously been bullish Bitcoin. Um, it's, it's obviously been on this incredible run. I just wonder about the round numbers that are piling up. We have 100,000 in Bitcoin, 6,000 on the S&P, uh, 45,000 on the Dow. It just feels as if we have the potential for people feeling as if, wow, we made it. Yeah. Is that a problem? Yeah. Well, maybe we're in a simulation, right? Yeah, yeah, there you go. In particular, he's not as bullish on energy stocks noting that even under a pro-drilling administration like Trump's, oil prices may not support the same kind of boom seen in previous cycles. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the fundamental arguments for Bitcoin are even stronger now than they were at the start of the year because I think we've gone from huge regulatory headwinds and governments hostile to potentially the U.S. making this a strategic sovereign asset at a time when uh, you know, again, it's proven itself as a pretty good store of value. I mean, whether you look at three-year, five-year, ten-year, and as you know, Bitcoin's total value is two trillion. Gold's network value is 19 trillion. Yeah. So Bitcoin has a lot of room to rise. All right. I'm just going to use that as a chance to point out that every time we talk about Bitcoin fundamentals, we're actually just talking about supply and demand. To me, it's to me, it's technical. Right. It's more people right. have more ways That's to buy right. more of it. Cyclicality and investment strategy. Lee suggests that. Over the next six months, investors should focus on cyclical stocks, those that perform well during economic growth and consider small caps, which are positioned to benefit from both their relative valuation advantage and faster earnings growth. Uh, yes, but you know, then again, that's how you talk about dollars or gold, sure, right? There is is because a dollar is exchangeable for a dollar. No, of course, but yeah. it moves on economic dynamics and things like that. All right, we have we're going to definitely have this discussion again. Tom, <laughs> Stephanie, Scott, really appreciate it. Everybody have a great weekend. Thanks for joining me here on Thanks, this Black Friday. I think uh, I'm kind of thinking the next three to six months we could get to about 6,300 on the S and P. But I I actually think uh, you can see better returns elsewhere. I do think with a higher interest rate environment, even if it, it comes down a little bit from here, stays in this range. In this segment, Tom Lee, 
co-founder and managing partner at Fundstrat Global Advisors, is discussing his views on the stock market and some key economic factors. Here's a breakdown of what he's saying. Granny Shots Easy Plays Lee uses the term granny shots to describe high quality, reliable investment opportunities that are easy to execute. These are stocks that are familiar, large cap, and in strong sectors or industries. He mentions that he has about 35 such names on his radar, which are spread across seven key investment themes. These stocks tend to be solid and have high conviction from Lee's side, as they're expected to perform well in the long term. Cyclicals and commodity prices he then discusses cyclical stocks, which are those that tend to do well when the economy is in an expansion phase e.g. energy, industrials and financials. While there's talk about how the performance of cyclicals might be impacted by commodity prices like oil, Lee argues that you don't necessarily need high commodity prices for cyclicals to perform well. In particular, he's not as bullish on energy stocks, noting that even under a pro-drilling administration like Trump's, oil prices may not support the same kind of boom seen in previous cycles. However, he sees a good environment for industrials and financials due to factors like mergers and acquisitions MA, falling cost of money interest rates, and deregulation. Reflation risk the final part of the discussion addresses the possibility of reflation or rising inflation expectations in the near future. Lee notes a measure called one-year inflation forward which tracks what the market expects inflation to be a year from now. This measure has been rising recently and is now at 3.6%. Historically, this level has been a trigger for concern in the markets, suggesting that inflation might be picking up. Lee doesn't point to a specific cause for this such as fiscal spending or other economic factors, but he notes that markets are beginning to worry about higher inflation expectations, which could influence the broader economic outlook. Tom Lee is pointing out that high-quality, large-cap stocks are likely to remain good investments granny shots, and while some cyclicals may struggle with commodity prices, there's still an environment that supports industries like industrials and financials. He also sees the potential for rising inflation expectations, which could become a concern for the markets. Tom Lee is discussing several key economic and market trends that he believes will shape investor sentiment and performance over the near term. Here's a breakdown of the main points he's making. Trade policy tariffs, Lee addresses the uncertainty around trade policies, particularly tariffs, which have been a consistent issue under the current administration. While trade could be a source of market volatility, he suggests that markets will respond to developments in real time, and the market's feedback could influence how trade policy unfolds. Lee believes that regardless of the trade situation, the broader business-friendly environment, including deregulation and lower corporate taxes, will likely support the market overall. Market fundamentals earnings Lee notes that corporate earnings have generally been strong, especially in sectors like industrials and technology. Although energy and healthcare sectors have been a drag, the outlook for earnings next year looks positive, driven by lower interest rates, a reduction in the cost of money and increasing housing activity. Additionally, if mergers and acquisitions pick up, this could benefit smaller companies, which tend to see more growth during such activity. Outlook for small caps Lee emphasises that small cap stocks are poised for better performance compared to large cap stocks. This is due to several factors. Small caps have underperformed for the last five years and are now trading at a significant discount about seven times lower price to earnings ratio compared to the SP500. Small cap companies have faster earnings growth and a large portion of their earnings around 44% is tied to cyclical sectors which tend to perform well in a strengthening economy cyclicality and investment strategy Lee suggests that, over the next six months, investors should focus on cyclical stocks, those that perform well during economic growth and consider small caps, which are positioned to benefit from both their relative valuation advantage and faster earnings growth. He also mentions Bitcoin as a potential area of interest, though that seems to be more of a secondary point. In this passage, Tom Lee is discussing the investment landscape, particularly focusing on sectors like regional banks and industrials, and their potential for outperforming the broader market, specifically the SP500. Here's a breakdown of the key points he's making. Regional banks and industrials, Tom Lee highlights these sectors as having a greater weight or influence compared to the SP500. This suggests that these sectors may perform better or have more room for growth in the current economic environment than the broader market indices. Cash on the sidelines, he mentions that there's a lot of cash on the sidelines, meaning that investors are holding cash instead of putting it into the market. This cash could potentially flow into small cap stocks, which may see growth if this money starts to be invested. 
Small cap stocks, he talks about how small cap stocks could benefit from factors like lower taxes and fewer regulations, especially if tariffs are not a burden. These stocks might be in a sweet spot for growth, as they have advantages that could lead to outperformance. Margin of outperformance Lee points out that small cap stocks have underperformed significantly in the past by nearly 100 percentage points. Given this underperformance, he suggests there is a lot of potential for recovery in outperformance in the coming years if conditions align. Elon Musk and Federal Reserve speculation Lee also references Elon Musk's comments about Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell potentially being challenged or even removed. He speculates that any attempts to influence the Federal Reserve could lead to a revolt in the bond market, which might not take kindly to political interference with the Fed's independence. In this clip, Tom Lee is talking about the Federal Reserve, the Fed, and its role in the global economy. He makes a few key points. The power of the Fed Lee emphasizes that the Federal Reserve is the most powerful entity in the world due to its control over monetary policy, which can significantly influence the economy. The Fed has the ability to set interest rates, manage inflation, and stabilize financial markets, making it central to the functioning of both the US economy and the global financial system. Fed's independence Lee highlights the importance of the Fed's independence. This means that the Fed operates without direct political interference, which allows it to make decisions based on economic data and long-term stability rather than political considerations. This independence is crucial for maintaining credibility and trust in the Fed's actions. Impact on the bond market, he suggests that even the bond market, one of the most significant financial markets, which is highly sensitive to interest rates and inflation respects the Fed's independence and decisions. If the Fed were to lose this independence, or if its actions were significantly altered, it could shake confidence in the stability of financial markets. Risks of changing the structure finally, Lee warns that changing the structure or functions of the Fed could have negative consequences for capital markets. This likely refers to the potential for destabilizing financial markets, as such a change could lead to uncertainty about how monetary policy would be managed and whether it would continue to be reliable and effective. In summary, Tom Lee is expressing that the Federal Reserve's independence and its current structure are crucial for maintaining stability in both the US economy and global financial markets. Any changes to this system could introduce risks and undermine confidence in the markets. In summary, Lee is emphasizing that certain sectors, like regional banks and industrials, may have more upside potential than the broader SP500. He also sees small cap stocks as being in a favorable position to outperform due to factors like lower taxes, fewer regulations, and no tariff issues. Finally, he touches on potential risks to the market, particularly if there's political pressure on the Federal Reserve, which could negatively impact bond markets. In summary, Tom Lee is expressing an optimistic view on the economy and the stock market, especially for small cap stocks, which he believes are undervalued and have strong growth prospects. While acknowledging the risks posed by trade policy, he feels the broader pro-business environment.